welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. You know why? What? I need God? You need God. I'm going to pray for you. No, we all need God. And so come on, stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. And let's just pray and ask God to do a great, mighty, marvelous thing. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Father, here we are. We haven't come into this place to hear from a man or woman. We haven't come to hear from an old man or young man or tall man or short man, white man, black man, brown man. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and in our lives today. Fill us with your word, your way, so that we can be all that you would have us to be. Now, Lord, we would ask that you bless us, but we want you to bless us all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are brothers and our sisters at no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers in one field building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. So bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, and Pentecostals, Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. We thank you for Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, Ecclesia Church. Thank you for the Way, San Bernardino Temple. Bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. Today, Lord, bless them as you would bless us and we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. Jesus' mighty name with a great big shout, we all say amen. Amen. Go ahead and take your seat. Just turn anywhere you want in the Bible. (laughs) We're in, but here's where we're going. We're in Hebrews, the fifth chapter. I'm going to read you verse number 11, verse number 12. I'm going to give you the title of the message. If you're making notes, and you ought to be. The maturity that matters is the title of the message. I don't know if you recognize this, but I'm going to share this before I read the verse to you, and I want you to listen. And I need you to listen because this is very important for all of you. What you're going to hear today is about you, about your life with the things of God. So important for all of us to see. I could say something to you, like for an example... I could say red and you be thinking pink and it doesn't work. I could be saying green and you could be thinking some other color and it doesn't work. And oftentimes what we do is when we go to the word of the Lord, God is saying something and he means it differently than how we understand it and it doesn't work. When I use the word maturity today, because that's really the subject about how important it is to be mature and maturity that matters. When I use the word maturity, there are two types of maturity that comes into thinking. At least for most people, there's only one, but there really is two. Two types. One, there's worldly maturity. What the world says. You get old, you experience things, you're Your ideologies and philosophies are based on your experiences. You're educated. You've been around for a while. You know, you may even look, have a few wrinkles, lost a few hairs. You're mature. And that's how the world perceives maturity as being around a while. But did you know that God sees the word maturity completely different than that at all? Maturity is not how old you are and how long you've been around, maturity is what you do with what God says. In other words, how you live life. An immature person or a childish person 
lives life according to the world standards. But a Christian lives life according to what God says. Living life according to the world standards and the worldly ways and understanding of the world keeps you childish according to the scripture. A baby that is in need. But doing things and growing up into maturity is doing what the word of God has to say. And that's what God describes as maturity in scripture. So when I read these verses to you, here you'll find the writer of Hebrews. He's just scolding, if you will, these people who, if you will, did not listen to the word of God, took it of no real importance, really never applied it, stayed in a worldly condition, making decisions in their life according to their worldly ideas, keeping them childish, and therefore there was so much more ahead of them but they never got it. Can I say this? It's in the Bible for a reason. It's not just talking about them. It's there as an example for us. In other words, we could be some of those people that don't really hear, don't really do anything but stay in a childish position when God wants us to grow up into maturity because there's so much more ahead of us. But he can't get us to maturity until there's some changes inside of us, until we understand some principles. And that's what we're looking at today. The call for maturity is very important and so important that it's been preserved in scriptures for thousands of years so that you and I can look at the importance of it today. So that you can understand what maturity really is all about. Again, I want to define it. There's two types of maturity. There's the world's understanding of how life is to be lived. That's a worldly material. Uh, uh, maturity that will keep you if you will described by God as a child a child is one who does things according to the ways of God uh, world but when you do things according to the ways of God now you become a mature person is anybody listening I could be childish with my relationship with wife. I could fight with Deborah and be childish, and I have many times acted like a child because I operate according to my flesh instead of according to what the Word of God says. But when I get off my flesh and I get on the Word of God, I go from a child to maturity. Is anybody listening? Yeah. And that's the kind of maturity it's going to take for you and I to experience while you're here on this earth all that God has for you. So we're going to look at the word of the Lord. Let me read it to you out of the fifth chapter, starting in verse number 11. Of whom, we're speaking of Melchizedek and Jesus, we have much to say and hard to explain since you were dull of hearing. You hear this word dull of hearing is like a knife in a drawer that has no edge. Have you ever tried to cut something that doesn't have a sharp edge to it? It's dull. It's still a knife, but it doesn't cut. It's still in the knife drawer, but it doesn't cut. It looks like a knife, but it has no edge. And we can be Christians and have no edge. Never get anything done because we, instead of hearing that changed us to making decisions and choices by God, we don't hear at all. And he makes this statement, and it's a great statement. He says, of whom I've got much to say, but you can't understand. Now, I want you to know something. Every time God speaks to you, he wants to build you. He wants to help you in your business. He wants to help you in your finances. He wants to help you with your marriage. He wants to help you raising children. He wants to help you relating with your relatives. He wants to help you in every area. God cares about you, but if we don't get it, man and we stay in our carnality, we stay in our worldliness, we're just children. So he comes along, verse number 12, for though by this time you ought to have been teachers. Teachers are people who live out the word of God, not just people who have a group in front of them that they're talking to and, you know, blackboard, that kind of a teacher. People are watching me all the time because I live out the word of God. Deborah lives out the word of God. We're examples of living the word of God. When you live the word of God, you're now teaching by what you live. And he says, you have time. You ought to have been teachers, but you need of someone to teach you, again, the first principles of the oracles of God. 
You have come to need milk and not solid food. In other words, here we are as children. We need milk. We grow to solid food. These people should have been in solid food and they've gone back to milk. All because they stayed in worldliness. They stayed in carnality, which is you're going to find a childish thing. Maturity is not how old you are. Maturity is not how long you've been around. Maturity is not how many verses you know. Maturity is how you and I live our life, whether we live it in accordance to the things of God or we don't live it in accordance to the things of God. Living out your life is what this is really all about in the ways of the Lord. Very important for us to see this. Very important for us to understand this. Worldliness equals childlikeness. When we find maturity, it's God-likeness. So simple to follow if you understand that. Now, God gave me a few things to share with you quickly this morning that'll help you in your walk of understanding maturity that really does matter so that you can apply it in your life. But in order for me to explain this to you, listen to this. You're going to have to understand that you're going to have to think. Now, you can go to church anywhere you want. You're free to go. You can go to churches. You don't have to think at all. They'll just blow smoke all over you. Just sit there brain dead and think you're going to be okay with God. Or you can think today. Most people, what you're going to hear today, you've never heard in a church in your life, for most of you that are in here. And I'm wanting you to hear because it's a full house. I'm wanting you to hear and not let your minds wander at all because this is vitally important because God wants you to be mature. Understanding maturity that really matters is meaning that you're going to have to pay attention and realize some simple things in order to get you on the maturity track. Are you ready? Let's take a look at it. Three things that God gave me. What mature people live like. What mature people live like, not just look like, but what they live like. Because this is about what you live like that determines whether you're a Christian that's mature or a Christian that's still a child or a baby. Are you following me? What mature people live like. Number one, they recognize God's plan for their life. Now, I want you to think for a moment. Did you know that most people in church, in fact, most people in this church today have no idea what God's real plan is for their life? Most people see themselves as people that were brought on this earth by chance. I happen to be here. Two people got together called mom and dad. Here I am. I didn't ask to be here. I'm living out life, and then I'm going to uh, accumulate as many things as I can do the best job I can to get along, and I guess that's what life's all about. Not true. There is a purpose why you were born, and there is a plan for you to be at this time and in this place. God knows exactly what he's doing. You gotta hear this. You are a very important commodity to God, and while you're here on earth, How you live your life determines how you will live eternity. The choices you make, the directions you get, will determine where you end up. There is a plan that most people don't understand, and it's the most simple plan in the world for your life. First of all, let me just share this with you. I was sharing it with my Bible college class the other night. Did you know in the last 500 years, over 1 million people came together in order for you to be in this room today? You may think you're alone on this planet. You may think and see yourself as insignificant. You may see and think yourself as unimportant. But 1 million people 
In the last 500 years, you didn't just get here. It was generation after generation. And those generations lived their time, whether it was 20 years, 40 years, 60, 80, 100 years. They lived their time and they died. And you don't even know who they are. And now it is your time to live. And your time to fulfill what they had an opportunity to fulfill, whether they did or didn't, I don't know, the plan of God. Over one million people in the last 500 years in order for you to be on the planet today. Don't tell me God doesn't have a plan and a purpose for your life. This is not a mistake. It is not a coincidence that you're here. Two drunken people didn't meet on a one night stand in a bar and you showed up. God knew who you were before the planet ever existed and knew you would be in this time and this age. And may I say this to you? If, if, you don't know the plan of God, you will live whatever plan the world has for you. And you will stay a child all your life instead of going on to the depth and riches that God has available for you. Are you following me at all? Most people don't know what that is. It's so simple. The whole purpose of everything is to bring you back to a place where you make decisions and get directions based on what God's word says. That's the plan of God. Let me say it again. The whole thing is to get you back to a place where you make decisions and get directions according to what God's word says instead of your own ideologies, your own philosophies. Most people, what they do is they gather data, they come to an accumulation of data, they form a conclusion, and they move on that conclusion based on their feelings and their understanding instead of based on God's word. When you keep it in the world and you do it based on your feelings instead of God's word, you always, as a Christian, stay childish. But if you do it according to God's word, you get blessed. Amen. The whole purpose of Jesus going to the cross and dying is to get you back in relationship with the Father. You say, well, I thought it was about heaven. Guess what? It is about heaven. That's called eternity. But notice how he left you here. And he comes and says these words. He says, I have come to give you life and give it how? More abundantly. He's not talking about heaven. You don't have to worry about an abundant life in heaven. He's talking about right now, here today. But if you don't know how to do what you know to do in the things of God, you will do what you think, stay in childish forever, never getting past the childish state, ever going on in maturity and being blessed. Is anybody listening? And if we don't understand the principle, the principle is so simple. God wants you to get directions from him. Because if you get the wrong directions, you end up in the wrong place. That's why you have GPS have you ever wanted to punch your GPS because they took you on a crazy route? What are you doing, man? I could have gotten there faster myself. The woman who doesn't understand never talks back. She's the only woman I've ever known who doesn't talk back. <laughs> Without the right directions in life, you will come up to the conclusions that you make determined on your humanity instead of on your spirituality keeping you an infant or a child, never entering into the blessings that God have for you. But the more you understand, where do we get this? How come we so easily make decisions for ourselves without consulting God, without getting directions from God? How do we do that? All back to the garden. Second chapter, God comes to Adam and Eve and says, listen, all the trees of the garden you can eat except the one right over there, that's a tree of knowledge of good and of evil. The tree of knowledge, listen to this, of good and of evil, the knowledge of good and evil. When you partake of that tree, you'll die. Third chapter, she is deceived, she's manipulated, she partakes, she fails. She gives it to her husband. She didn't die, he didn't die. The breach from God was there. Now, all of a sudden, they can make decisions on their own without consulting God. Before that time, it was always about what God said. They did what God said. They went where God said. They got directions from God. God had made everything perfect for them. God had blessed them. Now, they're going to make decisions for themselves, and it has never stopped since. Now, Jesus goes to the cross, dies for you and I. The blood has been shed so that you and I now can come back to the place where it's before the fall of Adam. We can 
can now hear from God and follow God once again. He not only washes us with his blood, gets us right with the Father, then he fills us with the Holy Spirit, then he gives us the word of God. My goodness sakes alive, we've got everything we need now to go back and follow God to the blessings. But we don't. We as Christians live in carnality, live in worldliness, making decisions by our flesh, and that keeps us as child. A childish person is one who is worldly. A mature person makes his decisions based on what God says. Are you following me? And did you know that most people, most, I'm talking about 90%, most people that attend church don't even have an idea of what I just said. And yet here's God saying to us, you know, I have something to say to you, but you can't hear it. In fact, let's take a look at the verses that just follow that. Go with me to verse number 13 of Hebrews 5th chapter. In verse 13 of Hebrews 5th chapter, let's just pop it up on the hill. For everyone who partakes only of, only of, only of milk. In other words, who's, who's a milk taker? He's a child. But everyone who only takes milk and then he comes along and he says, What's the, what does he say? Is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Where's the word of righteousness come from? God. So everybody that doesn't hear God's voice is unskilled in dealing with when you hear God's voice about how to get directions in life and what to do and where to go is somebody who needs milk. For he is a babe, the Bible says. Verse number 14, powerful verse. Listen to verse number 14, watch this. But solid food belongs to those that are full age. Circle the word full age, write the word mature. Mature is somebody who takes solid food. What's solid food? Solid food is God's word, God's directions, God's divine insight. I mean, I don't know how to be a good husband. I don't know how to be a good father. I don't know how to make business decisions. I don't know how to make life work. I don't know how to deal with my neighbors. I don't know how to deal with my boss. I don't know how to deal with life. How do I do that? I got to learn how through the righteous word of God. Full age person operates according to what God says. An immature, childish person operates according to their flesh, our worldliness. Watch this. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Well, how do I get the process of learning how to discern? Why do I need to discern what's good and evil? Doesn't the world outline what's good? Have you ever noticed lately they say what's good is really bad? Has anybody noticed that? And, and, and what is bad they call good? Does anybody notice that besides me? In other words, if I follow them, then that which is good is really bad in the eyes of God. And that which is bad is really good in the eyes of God. If I follow them, if I follow them instead of following the word of God that speaks to me and gives me directions in life, may I say this to you? Then I'm a child and I just need milk and I need to discern. Why do I need to discern? Because my ancestors back in the garden partook of the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. Listen to this. None of you in here have ever been trained in anything but answering to the flesh. You don't know anything else. You don't know anything else. The only way you're going to know how to answer to the things of God is by getting in and learning what the Word of God has to say and applying it. When Debbie and I in our fight, and we fight, how could two mouthy people not fight? <laughs> when Debbie and I fight, my goodness sakes alive, somebody's got to be mature, and it usually isn't me. Somebody's got to be mature and do the word of God. Or they will all just stay childish in our fighting. When I do the word of God, now I get out of childishness, I get into maturity, solve the problem. Is anybody listen? So I have to discern. Why do I have to discern? Because I only have been influenced by my flesh and worldliness. I don't know anything about spiritual stuff. But when I become a person that is born of the Spirit of God, I now have the ability to start learning, discerning, and doing, which, by the way, is the directions I need to get to the place I need to be. Is anybody listening? Wrong directions, wrong place. Is anybody listening? 
And that's what this is all about. So all of a sudden, the plan of God is for you and I to get back to a place through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ where we can hear from God and do what God says so that we can be blessed. Is anybody listening? That's cool. If you don't understand that, you'll just keep trying to do all kinds of things. We're talking about what mature people live like. Number two, mature people, they put an end to being a child. I, I, I think this is one of the neatest things that you'll ever see. They literally will put an end to it. Maturity isn't something that you just grow into. But that is which you decide to go to. We think maturity, we're going to grow into maturity. You don't. You decide to get into maturity. Are you following me? I have that on the overhead, but they didn't put that up. Thank you. Maturity isn't something that you just grow into, but that which you decide to go to. The go should have been capitalized because it's very important. When I decide to put down worldly and childish things and decide to live by the word of God and learn it and live by it, I start to become a mature person. If I don't, I stay childish all my life. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and as he writes to the church at Corinth, he makes a statement that is really cool in the 13th chapter. Go there with me in verse number 13. Oh, sorry, verse number 11. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11, pop it up on the overhead. says it like this. When I was a child, you ought to circle the word every time you see the word child and put the word in there worldly. Isn't that fascinating? Because that's what it is. If you want the definition, a child is someone who's a Christian who stays worldly. A mature person is someone who applies the word of God because that's the plan of God. Is anybody listening? Simple as that. When I was worldly, I spoke as a worldly person. I understand as a worldly person. I thought as a worldly person. But when I became a man, I put away worldly things. <laughs> are, are you following me? And for all of us that are in here, the goal is to live that kind of a life, and you know it. But if you don't know the plan and you don't know the purpose, and when he comes along and he scolds us for being immature, we don't understand what maturity is according to God and how to get there, my goodness sakes alive. Now, I want to point out something on the verse. You probably missed it. Watch this. I put away childish things. I put away. God didn't put away. Oh, God, help me to grow to maturity. It's not God's place. It's your place. It's you that says, I put away. I'm putting away worldliness. I'm making a commitment to the things of God. And I, if I'm going to make a, a commitment to the things of God and live by the things of God, because it's the plan of God for me to be brought back before the fall of Adam, it is the plan of God for me to hear from God, get directions from God, listen to God, to take me to where I need to be. If that's the plan of God, then i got to learn how to listen to the voice of the Lord. I need to know what is His good, because Jesus comes along in the New Testament and says these words, none good but God. Why do you call me? good. None good but God. Wait a minute. That means my good is not his good. I got to find out what his good is so I can make it my good. <laughs> is anybody listening? See, I got to find out what his good is to make it my good. If I don't know what his good is, then I'll just live on what I think is good. And that's why marriages stink and businesses stink and Christian walks are frustrating and we never get anything done. Is anybody listening today? We're talking about when mature people live, what they live like, what mature people live like. Number one, they recognize the plan of God. It's so simple. They put an end to being a child. They make the choice themselves to get into things of God. I'm going to learn how to make my marriage work according to God. I'm going to learn how to make business work. I am sick and tired of being broke. What does God say about it? And what do I have to do to get out of being broke? 
I'm tired of the way my relatives treat me and the way I treat relatives and the anger that I have and the issues that I'm carrying. I get rid of those issues by applying the word of God. I'm tired of being sick and tired. So you start to learn what the word of God has to say and start to apply it. You now become a mature person, but you're gonna have to make the decision. I can't make the decision. I want you to know something. I can't even preach good enough for you to do it. You have to do it. It's your call. Your responsibility. My responsibility is to stand here in front of you with veins popping out of my neck. <laughs> with some kind of passion to show you interest. <laughs> Come on now. You know I'm telling you the truth. Which brings us to number three. I love this. This is so cute, so great. What do they live like? They set goals to be like Christ. If you don't set a goal to be like Christ, you will not. See, I, I said that the other day in our Bible college class. I, I made this statement. It was a really interesting statement talking about how they could be like Jesus. It was like the whole class shut down on me. Wait a minute. Did you know he's our example he said, wait a minute now, he's a Messiah. He's a son, only begotten son of God. Don't mess with him. I know he's there, I'm here. He worked two several. Oh, wait a minute. I understand according to the Bible that you're a child of God, that God lives inside of you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know something, that he lives in you and you're in him. Are you telling me that you're just Mickey Mouse upon the earth? I don't think so. God gives you the power, gives you the direction, and gives you the suggestion to get into the word of the Lord. And we find ourselves oftentimes using Christ as an example, but never feeling, thinking that we can attain to where he's at. I'm not talking about deity in heaven that controls the heavens. I'm talking about just being in Christ Jesus as one who walked upon the planet. Are you following me? In Ephesians, the fourth chapter. First of all, before I read anything to you, verse number 11, let me tell you what verse 11 says. There's gifts given to you. You've got to understand that when God gives you a gift, he's given you a gift that has a purpose. He doesn't give you a gift to give you a gift to do nothing with it. If I buy you a pair of shoes, you're not going to put them on your shoulders. You put them on your feet. It has a purpose. What's the purpose of the shoes? Walking. Are you following me? God gives us gifts. Gives us five gifts. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Five gifts. All of those ministry gifts are given to you for a reason. Now watch this here. Remember, we're talking about being Christ-like. Keep that in mind. Making a goal to be Christ-like. Now watch this. Here is the reason found, if you will, Ephesians 4 chapter. Verse number 12. For the equipping of the saints. Did you know that every time you come to church, you ought to be equipped? Wait a minute. You didn't get it. The gifts that are given to you, including pastors, that's my job, is to equip you to get you ready to face the future, get you ready to deal with your family. Listen, you have one generation to live then they're going to drop you in a box and forget about you. Get a reality check. And one generation says this, what are you going to do with it? And he makes this for the equipping of the saints. My job is to equip you. Now, wait a minute. Did you know the church ought to be the maturity center of God's people? We have churches, the worship center, the healing center, the, the evangelistic center, that ought, ought to be the maturity center. Why? Because we're equipping you to do something. Listen to the words. For the work of the ministry, in other words, you're going to be the one that's going to be on display to a lost and dying world. For the edifying, the word edify means building, 
of the body of Christ. Did you know that you're the ones that build the body of Christ? People see your life and want to know what it is that you're doing. You tell them about Jesus and bring them into the house of God. You're building the house of God. Verse number 13 comes along, powerful verse. It says, until, now watch this, we all come into the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. See, to a perfect man, see the words perfect man? The word perfect man, circle in your Bible, means mature. That's translation. Do we all come into a place of maturity? We can be like Christ. How? To the measure and the stature and the fullness of Christ. We ought to have a goal that we're going to be like Christ. In our marriage, goal, be like Christ in our business. Goal, be like Christ in relating with people. Out there on the job, be like Christ. Verse number 14 comes along and says it like this. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro. Wait a minute, a child doesn't know anything. It's basing its whole future on carnality, basing its whole future on worldliness. So he says, we don't want to be tossed to and fro. We want to know it for a fact. Tossed of to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. See the word doctrine? It means teaching. In other words, here comes somebody comes along and teaches you something you don't know anything about God. You go for it and you end up in Guyana drinking grape juice. Hello. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Are you too young to remember Guyana and grape juice? That's where a thousand people went down there following some idiot and they drank some grape juice because he said it was full of poison and they died because they didn't understand the word of God. Are you following me? So that's a job is to edify you, strengthen you, build you up so that you're not a child. It is literally a maturity house. When you come into the church, that ought to be a place where you get strong in the things of God. Why? So you can listen to him, get directions from him, and end up in the right place in your home and family. He says, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. But watch this next verse. Kind of cool verse. It says, but speaking the truth in love, they may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ. I love that. Do we have another verse? Pop it up. From whom the whole body, that's all of us, joined and knit together. How are we joined and knit together? By every joint supplies. Did you know you're not called a bone? A bone in the body doesn't do anything. It just stays there. The joint moves. The church has been the bone long enough. It's time to get out of being a bone that doesn't do anything and be a joint that does something. And every one of us, according to that, have something to give. And listen to this. By uh, uh, every joint supply, according to the effectual working, by every part does its share. We're all together in this, causing growth to the body of Christ and edifying itself in what? Love. Yes, amen. <laughs> I mean, you talk about cool. So today... Maturity that matters is a maturity where people recognize the plan of God and live for the plan of God. If you don't know what the plan of God is, then buy the CD and listen to it 17 times until you finally get it. I'll give you the dumb CD. I don't care. I want you to grow up. Are you listening to me? And put an end, number two, to being a child. Make a decision. I'm going to follow God and not follow my flesh any longer, our worldliness. And number three, they set goals to be like Christ. No longer children tossed to and fro, but mature enough to understand what this is really all about. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't that good? It's going to be so good. Let me, let me do this. I'm going to ask everybody that is still seated, remain seated, and uh, nobody get up, because when you get up, you disturb people. Is that okay? So here's what I want you to do. Just stay seated. And I want to make sure that all of you are all right with God before you leave. Nothing could be worse. Coming in, and you are great listening, and you are great worshiping, great clapping your hands, a great shout for the Lord. You did just such a great job in church today. Nothing could be better than you coming and doing that. But here's the deal. What if you walked out, your heart stopped, you died? Would you go to heaven? Would you go to hell? Now, some people say, I don't believe in hell. doesn't make it go away because you don't believe in it. The Bible talks about it a lot. So let's talk about it for a moment. If you died 
in the next few minutes, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Well, almost all of you are going to say, well, I think I'm going to go to heaven. Uh, guess what? The problem with that is nowhere in the Bible is to say you get to think your way and whoever's a positive thinker gets to make it. You're not going to make it. Some of you might say, well, I love God a lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you love God you get to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. Some of you might say, well, I'm really a good person. I'm really, really good. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you're good you get to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to tell you the truth. Now, wait a minute. I can either get in your face and tell you the truth or I could just let you go, die, and go to hell. You want somebody to tell you the truth or not? Do you want somebody to say it like it is or do you want someone to blow smoke all over you? Come on, your call. You want to know the truth. So let me for a moment get in your face about where you're at. Today, it's your day of salvation. And God brought you here for a reason. So listen to me just for a moment. You can't get to heaven because you think you're going to make it. You can't get to heaven because you're a good guy. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. You cannot get to heaven because your mommy and your daddy told you you're a Christian when you were a kid. Took you to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when you were a child. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Had you christened or baptized when you were a baby, nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to heaven. You're not going to make it. Don't you think that heaven, Jesus goes across, a beaten, bloody mess for you. Don't you think he'd tell you exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven? Or do you think he just leaves it up to you? Well, you know, whatever you think is okay, whatever you think is okay, doesn't matter. That's a little bit weird. You're going to come back as a frog in four generations. and make, Come on, let's don't be stupid, nor treat God like he's stupid. He tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. Now listen, John 3rd chapter, he says these words, you must be born again. When I use the words born again, immediately a lot of people in American churches turn off. Why? Because you've been played with by the Hollywood media. They've displayed born-again people as idiots and radicals, fanaticals, and goofballs. But that's not what born-again means. Jesus said these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. And then he tells us exactly how to get to the Father. He said, you must be born again. You're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all all of your life. That's what born again means. From the beginning of the Bible, the end of the Bible, it means you've given God all of your heart and given God all of your life. I will prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Last book in the Bible, Jesus is speaking. And he says, I'm coming again. And you know he is. And he says these words were really strange words. He says, if, you, if I come again and I find you hot or if I find you cold, but if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just said by making that statement? People that are called Christians, that are lukewarm, are going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Now look, 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 look. Let me define for you what lukewarm is. It's a little in, a little out. It's a little up, it's a little down. It's a token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And then you're right back to the childishness of thinking you're going to make it. Today is your day of salvation. God brought you here for a reason to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life, to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying hell. You know what we talked about maturity? First step to maturity is getting out of yourself and getting in God. But you're going to have to make the call. I can't do it. So here we are in this safe, friendly place. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. Ah, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll sit. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang, when you hear that sound. Bang, your hand goes up, and I'll see your hand go up. When you put your hand up, here's what you're saying. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to give Jesus all of my heart, give Jesus all of my life. I want to be born again. I'll see your hand go up and put it right back down. So simple. So simple. 
Guess what? When you put your hand up, I'll see it. You say, wait a minute, pastor. Hold on, pastor. If I put my hand up, I'll be embarrassed. I'll feel funny. People I came with will see me. People behind me will see me. I'll feel weird. Uh Uh-huh. Get over it. It's better to feel weird in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Hey, it's your call. It's your choice. I can't make you do it, but you're dumb if you don't do it and get right with God. Let me tell you something. Today, God brought you here. Today is your day of salvation. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, you're full and you're all ready to get right with God. You need to get right with God by giving God. You're going to have to get your hand up and put it right back down. Who should raise your hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, you know who you are. I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people who have never given him all of your life, you know who you are. I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people who are saying, I'm not sure if I should, I'm not sure if I've done this, I'm not sure if I, make sure today is your day of salvation. I've done my job, I'm counting to three, pop my hands together, sit there and do nothing, and God will do nothing on your behalf. But make the effort. God says, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll say it, I'll confess you as mine for my Father. Today is your day of salvation. Are you ready? Here it is. One. Two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Back in that family room, nineteen, twenty. Thank you. Back over here, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. Back over here. Thank you. Twenty-six. Thank you. I got them. Twenty-six. What? Like, like there's, there's nobody on this side. There's, there's nobody. Why all the heathens sat on this side today, right? <laughs> Oh, is there four back there? What, was I, what number was I at? 26 and four. 42. <laughs> 30, God bless you. Anybody else, real quick? There's 30 wise people. Anybody? Anybody else? On this side, there's somebody. Oh, man, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Come on. Okay, now look. Here's what I want you to do. Now, don't mess with me now. Don't mess with me. All 30 of you, I want you to get out of your seat. Get your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. Get in the aisle. Anybody that should have raised their hand, but you didn't and you know it, you get out of your seat, get down here too. Check with your neighbor. Say, come on, I'll go with you if you need to go. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. If you raised your hand, you're serious about God, get down here right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. They're coming, they're still coming. They're still coming. Give them a hand as they come. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Well, praise God, there's more. There's like 42 of you, by the way. Uh, I want you to look over here to the left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel, a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to do three things. First thing he's going to do is lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Second thing he's going to do, give you some free stuff to take home and read about. What to do next now that you're a Christian? God wants you to know what to do now that you're a Christian, what to do next. Third thing he's going to tell you about is a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. He'll explain what that means. It's a program to help you get strong in Jesus, mature, so you don't fall back through the cracks and go back doing the same old stuff that you did before. Let us help you get strong with Jesus. Is that okay? Oh, I'm putting my application in to be your pastor. Man, I'm mouthy and I'm in your face, but guess what? You're going to be, and I'll kick your butt all the way to heaven, but when you get, when you get to heaven, when you get to heaven, 
and you will say, thank God I had a shepherd with a staff. I need to be hit every now and then to, to get in line with God. Come on now. We'll help you and love you while we do it. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.